All right, welcome everyone. We have a very special podcast today. The man, the myth, over in Australia, Andrew Bogut, who is the former number one overall NBA draft pick. It's pretty crazy. 2005, one NBA championship, was the player of the year in college. He's got a long resume. We're not just going to talk about the accolades, but we are going to check in and cover a lot of topics today. Andrew, how are you? Good. Yourself. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Thank you for taking the time. I know we got kind of connected through mutual contacts. Shout out to Partha. Uh, you, you know, lasso and, and prize picks. I think maybe even some other stuff that we we have cross involvement with. But um, yeah, thanks for the time. And uh, I know you're you're tight on time, so we'll try to make the most of it in an hour. Uh, as a podcast host, I know you know how it is. Before I dive into other stuff, how did the podcast come about, man? It seems like everyone is doing podcasts now. When did you decide you want to do one? I kind of probably the last couple of years. It's funny because I made a joke maybe three years ago, like, damn, every man and his dog has got a podcast and here I am. So a bit of a hypocrite, but uh, yeah, I just look, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, say what I think type guy. Uh, what you see is what you get, which is kind of rare for an athlete. Uh, for the most part, most athletes are, are PR trained and told what to, what, what they can and can't say. So I just figured the podcast for me would be my best outlet to express who I am and what I'm passionate about. Be able to just, you know, have long form conversations much like you're having. And, you know, if I do short term interviews, I'm very easy to, to, to be clickbaited just because yeah. if you don't hear the whole context of what I'm saying, you can grab a, a sound by to make me sound like an absolute moron. Um, so that was why I want to do the podcast and a few unique things with it. Like we do a weekly basketball show, like the normal stuff. But the one that I've done that's pretty unique is um, decided to do an autobiography type. Uh, like what a book would read like, but via podcast, if that makes sense. So basically when I was a young kid is episode one, then teenage years was episode two, and it just keeps going in chronological order and it's going to end um, upon retirement. So I don't know how many episodes that'll be. I think we're up to episode, I think nine or 10 of the My Journey series. And it's been pretty successful. Um, I didn't think it'd be as, as popular as it is. So That's very cool. And, and nowadays with, you kind of hint on it, but with canceled culture, all this crazy stuff. Like I, I just, you know, I actually were probably a little behind. I just saw this Joe Rogan stuff yesterday, you know, talking about this, how this stuff's used in context or not. And you know, it's a bit tricky as a public figure. I'm sure you've dealt with stuff as well along the way where, where like a clip or a blurb gets taken out of context or either way, if you want to express yourself. You have to be careful. What are your thoughts on this kind of canceled culture and, and how do you, how do you just defend yourself in some ways? And, 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 and how do you go about all that? Well, I've had it with my podcast, but you know, some journalists have taken a clip out of my podcast and 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 put it in an article, and then it's and then I'm like, hey, how about you? How about you put the whole paragraph or the whole three minute spiel before or after that? And people can take that for what it's worth. But look, I mean, cancel culture is it's just you're appeasing people that live for this stuff, right? Um, I heard Bill Burr say this many many years ago. He said, I don't know what he was. He might have been on Conan or somewhere. He said, if you take the worst conversation you've ever had, whether it be with a family member, a friend, whether you were 15 years old or whether you were 30 years old, about anything, the worst conversation you've had, whether you've used profanities, recorded and put on the internet, you'll be canceled. And if, if you're saying you've never had a bad conversation, now it, could, it might not be to the extent what we're seeing for some people, but it might be something as innocuous as, this guy's a, this guy's an idiot or this woman's a, I hate her or this guy only got his job because of his father. That's all offensive, cancelable stuff, right? So um, if you take one one recording from your lifetime, put it public all over social media, you'll be cancelled. So right. where are we going? I, I mean, you want, um, you want people to be able to express themselves. I don't condone, obviously, blatant violent threats and blatant racism and sexism and, and whatnot, but... You know, you got to take it into context too. You can't just, you know, be clickbaited by some of these bites that are coming out. So I'm, I'm strongly against it. Um, I'm part of the never apologize mob. Uh, I think um, as far as to the cancelers, to the people that want to try to cancel you, I'm all, I'm all for apologizing when you make a mistake, but I'm not for apologizing to the people that are trying to cancel you and destroy your livelihood and find out where you live. And I think the more you appease those people, the more this is going to continue. For sure. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a tricky thing with technology, social media nowadays. Everything's kind of happening so fast. It's uh it's car it's hard to keep up and it's just there's there's a lot going on there. Well, I know you've you've done a lot of podcasts, you've done a lot of media, you've done a lot of content. I don't want to just cover your whole career because I'm sure you've done this a lot and you have a lot of accolades, but I guess for those that aren't somehow familiar with you, if they're not, maybe just give like a brief um 
you know, I, I mentioned your number one overall draft pick. That's got to feel good at all times. No one can ever take that away from you. The first ever from Australia. How did you, how did you end up in, in Utah? Cause uh, I believe like, it's not like uh, when I think college basketball powerhouses, you know, it's not who I think of. And you were, you ended up being the number one draft pick You had a unbelievable career there. How did you decide on there and where else were you looking at when you made that decision? Yeah, look, back then, Australia wasn't the hotbed it is today for um, basketball players going not only to college but the NBA, right? Like, we, we didn't even have an NBA player in the league at that time when I went to college um, from Australia. So a lot of the smaller schools would recruit Australian guys. So, you know, St. Mary's was probably the f- forefront for a smaller school that was getting the hotbed of Australian talent. And then, you know, your Cal Poly, Caltech, Cal Irvines, those kind of schools, the smaller schools would just come over here and – and then I guess Utah came in when a mutual friend of mine that I was working out with a club team, just not playing for him, but just working out with their squad. An assistant coach saw me, called Rick Majerus, who was the head coach of Utah at yeah. the time, one of the greatest coaches of all time. And they, they sent out a, an assistant coach and um, the rest was history. They recruited me from day dot. And I, I didn't want to go to a a big time party school that I saw on the movies, um, like a, you know, UCLA or a Florida or one of those schools. Cause yeah. I thought I want to go somewhere where I'm kind of concentrating on what I should be concentrating on. And that was basketball. Like I, I make a joke that people ask like, what, what did you study? And I said, basketball, right? Like that was one, two and three for me. I wasn't a horrible student by any means. Like my GPA was around a three got by, did the bare minimum and, and still, still got through with a 3.0. But basketball was my goal, and I thought Utah, you know, it's not known as a, as a party city. Um, although, wherever you are in the world, if you want to find trouble, you can find trouble, right? Um, yeah. But it just helped me concentrate a bit more on, on what I was there for, and it worked It worked perfectly strategically for me because I didn't expect to, to be the number one pick in two years. I'll, I'll be lying to you if I said that. I just – to get drafted, even the second round would have been a goal for me before my freshman year, but it all just came together so quickly in a small amount of time, and – all of a sudden, I'm, I'm shaking David Stern's hand as the first pick. Yeah, that's that's got to be a bit overwhelming to to know uh, to go, to have that happen. I mean, when you left though for college, you were there was the hype around you though, like at that point, like because I mean, obviously you had a ridiculous couple of years, but were you highly touted? Did you, was it pretty clear you would go to the NBA, or it's really hard going in as a freshman at college to even have that kind of idea? Not to mention, you know, you are in Australia, like you said. There's not one NBA player. So, like, you may be crushing and just, like, the best thing since sliced bread there, but it's kind of maybe hard uh, to, to know, right, how you're going to shape, how it's going to work out, how it shapes up. Of course, there can be injuries and whatnot. Um, what was – was that your actual goal, like, to just get drafted when you when you left for college, or what was your goal? I didn't really have that goal going into college. I mean, a goal for me as a young fellow was just if I could play professionally anywhere and someone gave me money, I was sold, right? Like, where do I sign? You know what I'm saying? So, um once I got to college, my freshman year, I had a really good freshman year. I averaged 13 and 10 at night. Still was real skinny, real light. Had to put some weight on. Um, and then probably after that freshman year was when I thought, you know, the NBA is a realistic goal. Just, you know, I started showing up on draft boards after that freshman year. But going into my freshman year, I was still relatively unknown. Right before my freshman year, um, like two months before we had the world junior championships under 19s in Greece and I won the MVP all-star five and we won our first ever gold medal for Australia in the under 19 level. So that put me on the map a little bit. I started getting, before I even got to college, I had European teams offering me multi-million dollar contracts and that was hard to turn down because I was a kid that didn't grow up with a whole lot of money and our family had good years and bad years because my dad ran his own business. So it was all determined upon the economy and how things were going. So it was hard to turn that down. Um, you know, some big teams in, you know, Panathinaikos, Olympiakos, um, you know, Benetton Treviso was, was really big in Italy back then. They were, they were all throwing feelers out to see if I'd leave college because obviously in college you don't get paid. Right. But I stuck to my word and and, and showed up to Utah. And, um, yeah, my, my whole journey just happened so quickly in a small amount of time. I, yeah, it's hard to believe because I the thing that stands out from the notes to, is about at 15 years old, cut from the Victoria Junior State representative team i mean that seems pretty insane like that's got to be you know there's you hear these stories and you know michael jordan gets cut and this and that right but like it's that's just like a fast turnaround you were 15 and, and you're talking about you know sophomore in college or you know foregoing and getting number one overall draft pick like was it a growth spurt was it just like what was it where did how do you go from getting cut from a junior team to that like it's almost impossible 
Like what, what happened? What, what was like a turning point or a moment or was it, was it your work ethic? Was it, you know, a little bit of luck? What, like, give me your, give me the formula. How do you get drafted number one from being cut 15 years old? Oh, obviously you need some luck along the way, but you know, high helps. Um, but I knew, I knew my work ethic was unmatched even as an 11, 12 year old. Um, but a lot of times I was catching up to my body growing. I was kind of, you know, you'd grow so fast, you then be uncoordinated for a couple of months till you got your feel back for your body, all that kind of stuff. So I, I knew I was always out working all the other kids. I was just never as talented as them. So at a, as a junior, you know, most coaches, this is the unfortunate reality of junior sports. These under 14s, under 16s coaches, they're about win now. They don't care about like, oh, this guy's going to probably be a pro. I should put him in the team develop him and then they don't care about that I, I want to win my under 14 championship which is in my opinion is wrong you want to you want to instill winning and teach it but you also need to pick the kids that you know unfortunately the five foot you know or, or the five foot eight kid at 11 years old that you can tell is probably at the peak of their development already or 12 years old they're already you know got hair on their legs and whatever they're not going to probably be a pro it's just the reality of it because they're they're bigger and stronger than all the kids at 12 but they don't then progress and that's exactly what happened i started catching up to everyone maturity wise and I just put the time in um, and getting cut from that team probably was the best thing for me or it was the best thing for me not probably um, because I feel like if I made that team I probably would have taken the foot off the gas and thought oh, I'm a rock star I've made the state team um, whereas I didn't make it uh, they gave me an emergency spot funnily enough which meant that um, so the way our system works in Australia the national championships fund 18s were July so they picked the squads in January and then you train twice a week on the weekends, right? They put me as an emergency. So that meant I was in the squad, but I wasn't going. I'd only go if someone else got hurt in the meantime, right? Okay. So the beauty of that was I got to train with all the guys that made it over me still. And because they'd made it, they probably thought, you know, I'm just coasting to get to that nationals, do the bare minimum or whatever. Like, I don't want to get hurt. And they got this asshole like me who's an emergency. And I just came in there every day every training session just trying to beat the shit out of every one of them, like literally, you know, and um, that's kind of, that was my mentality throughout that process. And it, I just made a huge jump within like a, a one year period after being cut. I then made the um, Australian junior national team camp. And the funny thing about that is that's usually selected from kids that go to the nationals. I didn't go to the nationals. So I basically got like a wild card because they heard I was, you know, going up, you know, Right. And working, working hard and ended up going to that camp. No one had ever heard of me. All the other kids from other states never heard of me because I hadn't been to the Nationals. Like, who the hell is this kid? And I, the first day of camp, I kicked everyone's ass and they offered me a scholarship to the AIS on the spot. Went there for two years, then went to college. And wow. yeah, it all just, it's just all came together. And I think a bit of luck in there, but I put a lot of time into my craft that people didn't, you know, people think, oh, you grew to seven foot, you're lucky. Well, I know a lot of seven footers that, that don't make it in basketball. It's not as easy as that. Um, you've got to put a lot of time and effort in. And, yeah, having the height definitely helped, but you can't, you yeah. can't beat time and effort. For sure. No, there's no doubt about that. And you, you mentioned we talked a little bit about luck. You know, this is – poker is like the main focus or, or sort of the topic that stems from, in my world, give me a little bit of your poker experience background and, and how do you – how would you translate or correlate, I should say, poker and basketball or sports because like dealing with variance and luck I mean we could spend uh, days talking about probably some of the games that you've won lost series comebacks ahead behind but do you see a really big similarity there what is the the biggest uh sort of um thing that you can take from one to another yeah I mean just the strategy um the ups and downs you know I think having you know having bad weeks having good months how learning how to handle when you're winning and playing yeah. really well learning how to handle where you're losing and just can't get a hand or can't, can't, you know, someone just keeps lucking out on you. Same as basketball. Like it's exactly the same. And um, it's, they're both pro kind of sports are probably a testament to sticking with it and sticking to your foundational principles about how you play or your strategy or whatever, and, and being confident in that, um, you know, risk, you know, risk adverse, like, what, what what end of the seesaw are you? Um, are yeah. you a rock? Are you are you wild? Are you a fish? Like, so yeah, it really translates strategy wise, mentally. Um, I mean, I got involved in poker. I think in two thousand and six. I I used to see poker on TV when I first got to the US on ESPN, and I used to hate it, seeing it on TV because I didn't I didn't really I understood hands. Yeah. I didn't know the format of Texas Hold'em though. Like, I didn't really know the intricacies of it. I I just knew basic hand cards from playing five card draw back in the day, but. I used to see it and be like, why the hell is this on TV? This isn't sport. It's cards. Like, it used to just frustrate me, right? And then my, a friend of mine 
he went to the University of Baylor in Texas, Australian guy, was on that national team with me, the junior national team that won gold. And we had a world championships in 06 and I had a PlayStation Portable back in the day and I had, I had the World Series of Poker game. I never played it. And he's like, have you played that? I said, no, nah, I don't know how to play it. You know, I'm not a fan. And he, all he did was just taught me basically the nuances of, you know, flop, turn, river, betting patterns, how it all works, big blind, small blind, which I didn't understand. So then I just started playing a little bit on there, but then I started watching it on TV. Then I ended up loving it because I was learning off TV. Right. And then I just started playing more and more. I picked up some home games when I was in Milwaukee. Um, and then when I got to the Bay Area, I that's how I met, you know, a mutual friend, Phil Helmuth. I'm sure he'll love me dropping his name. Um, and, yeah, I ended up just getting in some big games uh, over there with, with a lot of people that are, you know, big poker players. And I'm still in a group that we play via an app to this day. So, um, yeah, just really, for me, playing poker – during basketball season was a great mental release for me because as you know, at a poker table, you can't really think about anything else. You can't think about your bad game. You can't think about, you know, whatever troubles you have in your life. So it really got me mentally away from any other stress for that three, four, five, six, seven hours, however long I played. And that was another reason why I really enjoyed it more so than, than just, you know, the thrill of the gamble and whatnot. Very cool. And, and without any names or, you know, you've been on you've been on several teams. You've you've been playing, I guess, professionally. You played for over like what fifteen years or so, and I'm sure you've seen some crazy stuff, right? Poker, like I know it's a very common game. People like to play on the plane. Uh, there's other forms of poker too, like guts and, and different things. Is there any story, without giving any names, of course, that was like a crazy pot or something like that you saw that got out, that just got that was wild, like within, let's say. Um, you know, I don't know. Is there any gambling story you could tell me without using names that was like kind of crazy that even blew your uh, mind? Or yeah, there's a lot. Um, there's okay. a lot. You don't there's, have. We had. I mean, it's known that the Warriors. We played a lot of poker. We had a group: myself, Draymond, Clay, Steph, David Lee, um, and sometimes a few other people would always play every plane trip, and that was known. It's not. It's not a secret. You, we and like literally, as soon as we got on the plane, before the wheels were up, we had we had cards flying. At times we'd land and people, the whole plane would be the plane and we'd still be finishing a hand. So the craziest stories, I mean, Bure's is, they play a lot of Bure if you're familiar yeah. with that game, which that is a painful game. I'm not a fan of it because there's really no strategy, not too much strategy involved. Um, two worst stories, we played a game called in between. So we had, we went through a phase where it was dealer's choice, any game. It wasn't just poker. You could right. dealer Whatever. We played a game called In Between, which those is basically posts, just, those posts can the pots can get on get crazy, man. I can't imagine that that that. You level. know about In Between? Oh yeah, when you hit when it's like an eight when you got the the deuce and the king and you go all in and it, it comes, you can't believe it could actually come and you're paying double and then yeah. I, I actually have a story when I because I played soccer growing up through college and there was one time where it just got so crazy for like our roles. Like we, we had to like redistribute the pot and do something. Cause it got, it got like, you actually got out of hand. So I'm, I can't imagine, but yeah, that, that'd be no, sure. it's us. So for people that aren't familiar, I'm sure most of your followers are gamblers. So or poker players at least, but yeah, in between you, you basically two, two cards face up. And if it's a King and a five, you then say, I bet the pot that it's going to be hit in between that. If it hits the sides, King or five or in between those, you got to match the pot, right? Or you can bet an amount out of the pot. You don't have to take the whole pot. Or you can just say pass, and then it's the next person's chance, right? So all we we were putting, tw I think we we're putting twenty dollars a uh, person in. So we had five players. So we had a hundred dollars to start, right? We had we had one round that got up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from twenty dollar. From twenty from we couldn't believe it. It was it was getting oh so ridiculous God. that it was oh. like I'm not making this up. It was like dudes would have king deuce pot king would hit match the pot and then it'd be you know what i'm saying it just kept it just kept hitting the sides every time like guys had huge odds to, to scoop the pot bang so even we stopped as nba players and we're like nah like that's gonna hurt someone that's 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 a couple of checks so we, we took a zero off it and some guys weren't too happy because they're like hey that's my chance to win it someone else owes that money but we agreed to just take a zero off and, and done the 26 or twenty five thousand. but wow. that was a crazy one and then i had there was one team I was on. I'm not going to name who it was, but we had, you know, athletes are real competitive. It's like, you're not going to big boy me out of a pot kind of mentality, which yep. you don't want to have in poker, right? And we had a guy um, that I played with who was great to play with for this reason was that he he basically would get frustrated. He got stacked. He would rebuy for the max stack at the table. That was our rule at the time. You could rebuy for the max stack at the table. 
and he would put his whole stack in pre-deal. Um, I'm all in because he was so frustrated. So it was just a matter of like, pick my cards up, oh, shitty hand, fold, and then he'd do it again the next hand because he scooped, you know, $30 of big blinds. I think we're playing 10, 2010 at that time or whatever. And he's yeah. got 1000 2000 3000 sitting in there. And he did this for like three or four straight playing trips until he had to stop playing. Um, <laughs> so... Um, they're probably that's the two craziest. Whole strategy, yeah. That's that, yeah. That's expensive, fast for sure. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of craziness. Athletes are competitive, passionate people that probably we get dumb passionate sometimes and don't see straight. And I try to, you know, I try to play on that a little bit um, when I played on planes. But um, I did pretty well on on most trips. Very nice. And and I see you. You seem based on investments and just over. You started a podcast. You seem pretty business savvy and, and motivated was this when did this kind of entrepreneurial spirit come into come into play was this like early on in your mba career was it after you retired when did you decide like all right i want to start investing i want to I, I would imagine being in the bay area around some of these guys and this you know it's got to be pretty cool right like one of the more forward thinking and, and current event stuff going on in the world in tech but for you when did it when did you really dive in and want to get involved with these type of projects and investments I was doing some small business stuff pre getting the Golden State. So like probably from 2009, 10, 11, started, you know, doing some small business stuff in Australia and learning the hard way. A few of them didn't, didn't do too well, just my own personal stuff, kind of business stuff. And I think that's the best way to learn is to fail in those kind of circumstances. Um, and then when get when I got to, to Golden State, um, you know, I think I would, I would have been an idiot not to network with some of the people that were involved with our club involved with with organization um friends of friends and you know i ended up networking through a lot of those people through poker of all of all places i ended up in a poker game with without name and name ended up in a poker game with some of the most powerful people in in in, in venture capital and, and angel investing and startups you know um and they were fantastic people and i'm still friends with them to this day and a few of them I picked their brain. I started. I just. I just started asking questions. And no matter how dumb they were, I'm like, these are the best in the world. Like, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be that annoying guy. Not so much during the poker game, but I'd hit him up afterwards. Hey, I want to get started in this. What do I need to do? And I had a guy that that mentored me somewhat with how you know how to get involved in VC stuff and startups, what to look for in a company, the different strategies. Like some some angels that they have the spray and pray mentality, which means that they invest in a boatload of things a year and hope one hits. So that could be a hundred different companies in small amounts. And then you have your more really conservative. We're going to do five or six big deals a year. So learning all the nuances of that, and it all comes down to networking. It all comes down to who, you know, so I got involved early on. I just basically said, Hey, the next time you guys have good deals, come to your table. I'd love to get involved. Keep me in mind. And that's what happened. They had things come through, come across their desk that they were investing in and like, Hey, We've got a few a few points. If you want to jump in with us, uh, we'd love to have you on board. And then I realized that I can use my brand and my leverage and my social media presence to do some of these deals myself down the line. Um, so if a company comes to me and says, we want you to invest in our company, I've done deals where it's it's hybrid to an extent where, you know, I might get a bit more of a discount in return. I give them some marketing support. I give them some networking support with my connections over in, in, in the US or Australia and, just learning it that way. And, you know, like I said, there's, there's been a lot, a lot of things that have done well. There's been some that haven't. Um, there's been some businesses that have gone, gone under within two or three years. And there's been some that have been, you know, bought out by big companies like Amazon. So it's all about learning along the way and continuing to network. And hopefully, hopefully we all hit a few unicorns along the way. Yeah. I mean, I look at investing a lot like poker tournaments in particular, because it's, it's like, you don't know the, you know, the buy-in size, you could play a $200 buy-in, and you win it online or you play the 10K main event and win it. And ultimately the game's not like that different. It is, of course, you know, just like an investment, there's obstacles and, and risk you take that are more so in one than the other, but the, the risk rewards bigger, but ultimately in a tournament, yeah, you could play great, be out, knocked out, or you could get lucky and, and win in a bigger one and, and whatever. So it's very, I think it's very similar in that sense. It's just funny because like your min cash of a huge one, or you may not cash, right? So it's like, you don't really know which one's going to work. And as you said, that sort of smash and cover, spray and pray, you kind of just, you want to diversify. And it's, it's interesting. There is, of course, some luck on that, on how they shake out, which ones double, which ones go to zero, which ones you hit uh, 10Xs. Have you actually, have you been to a point now where you've seen some of these investments come to fruition? I know 
you know, prize picks we've been on together now. It seems to be doing very, very well. Lasso as well. Partha was just on. I've had Adam Wexler on the show. And those companies seem to be flourishing. Have you had any that have actually exited yet? Because, you know, I'm still in the phase where I got all my seeds kind of sprinkle around. I'm going to wonder if I'm a fish or not. Like in three years, you know, we'll check back in and hopefully hit a couple. It doesn't take many. You just can't brick everything. But but have you actually cashed out or, I mean, had any success yet? Yeah, one 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 company um, called PillPack that I was involved in got, got bought by Amazon fairly quickly. Um, I think it was within two and a half to three years of, of, of investing in it. Um, PillPack were a company that were to your door prescription medications and they had some loopholes in some states because of legislation. They couldn't get it across the line, but a lot of states were accepting of it. I think they started out in, um, it was Maine or New Hampshire, somewhere up that way. And, yeah. and yeah, Amazon Amazon bought them out um, within two or three years of investment. So that was a quick one and probably not not normal. You don't usually exit that quickly. But, yeah, to your point, I think most of, the, most of my investments, the way I get involved with startups is it's generally – um, money that I, I don't need to live off. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I highly, I probably don't recommend people investing money that they need for everyday purposes, putting it into VC, putting it into even stocks, even gambling with it to an extent, right? You, you kind of want to budget yourself in a way where you've got your burn money. And um, I'm fortunate enough to have enough of that to, to, to be able to still, you know, hit some home runs. And that's kind of the way I look at it. But yeah, I mean, most of my stuff would be like you right now. You just, you just, you're just sitting, sitting and waiting for that five, 10 year, 15 year. And um, yeah, but I've had, I've had, I've had a fair bit of success with PillPack. And then there's a company in Australia. I haven't cashed out, but it's just gone gangbusters. Um, it's actually in the, the funeral industry, funnily enough. It was, um, I'll give them a shout out, Bear, Bear, Bear Cremation. Um, basically, a, you know, really really easy to use way of of getting bare bones costs for funerals and, and cremations um and the funny story behind that real quick was that the only reason I, I got involved with them was my grandfather had passed away a couple of years ago and i was involved with the funeral um, i took care of you know the payments and whatnot and i just saw how seedy of an industry it is it's like they were preying on people's emotions and, you know, going up to my grandma and things like, Oh, you, you know, here's your flower options, you know, yeah, really expensive, moderate, low. And, you know, you pick, you pick low or moderate, Oh, you know, didn't he mean more, more to you than that? Like that kind of shit. And I, and oh, I saw man. it firsthand and I was like, yeah. this is like, this is the lowest you're preying on someone right now that is highly emotional. Um, they would probably, my grandma would say, I'd, I'd, I'd spend a million dollars on my grandfather and she Problem is she doesn't have a million dollars, right? So then a lot of people get their eyeballs of debt through funerals of all places. Yeah. So I, I went through that, and then literally three months later, across my desk came an opportunity to invest in a in a company that was going to try to shake up the funeral industry. I was like, done, <laughs> done, fits in perfectly, and ended up being you know it's it's gone gone gangbusters. Um, so that was one just one funny story of of how I got involved in something was because I. I actually felt the pain of how, how shitty that industry is for the most part. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's that's like the you know now you see the Ubers and the the, the the Postmates and these type of technology apps or things that there's big opportunities that technology can really address sort of uh, inefficient industries and that's it is uh, it, it's kind of wild right to see how fast things are moving and and how things are getting optimized and just in the blink of an eye the, the blockbuster Hollywood videos get replaced by Netflix and. You know, all this stuff is changing so fast. So it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, like you said, there's there's a lot of inefficient markets. And um, that that is, uh, I, I haven't heard, I don't know if there's, is there something similar in the U.S. or, or no? Because that seems like a very... I no, mean, that's what we, I mean, they will try to get over there. Um, obviously, the problem is, you know, legislation in the U.S., well, not as bad as Australia, but in the U.S. with every state's just so different um, as, right. as I've seen in the U.S. with gambling and with marijuana, Um spots and all that kind of stuff i think um that's the hard thing in the u.s is navigating state to state whereas in in australia for the most part you know you, it's an australian law you can pretty much get it passed um in most states unless you're in coronavirus of course and they all go individual and have different states but other than that yeah hopefully it's just just it's just a simple way and you know it's rock bottom pricing you know um no bells and whistles they're not trying to upcharge you there are things that you can get to go a little bit nicer if you want to 
but it's all at your discretion, right? Right. Um, it's not, it's, a, not, it's a, not in your face and make you, they're not. Exactly. It's not a guy in a suit. It's like, Some, hey, you know, so um, it just makes a lot of people that use the service, the reviews are really good. They, they love it because they, they feel like it's their doing and, and their choice. They're not getting coerced or pushed and then it, it's very affordable. Like it's not, they don't, they don't have to remortgage their house and then to pay for, you know, the, the coffin if they go that route or all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I think it's a no-brainer. And like you said, it, it's come in because there's been so many shady people like the taxi industry, you know, so the, the beauty of technology is it then puts an onus back onto those people that have just milked the public for so long to be like, Hey, like you need to start, you need, you need to start doing better. You need to have a clean taxi. You need to have, you know what I'm saying? So I think it just makes total sense. Yeah, that, that does. And, and what do you, what about the NIL? Cause this is something that of course, someone like yourself would have tremendously benefited from being the number one overall pick and one of the top, players in college and prospects like what are your initial thoughts on this and are there a lot of complications or is it just just a no-brainer because yeah why you know a lot of these guys aren't going to get to make money guys or girls athletes won't be, be able to get to go to the next level or the pros or semi-pros or other divisions do you think that um this is a great thing or there, do you think there's some potential complications with this too well look i think that they definitely need to compensate athletes enough to live like that's a no-brainer to me uh, i mean when i was in college this is a get off my lawn rant, but you know, I had to get a job to make money to basically be able to eat. Uh, my second year, my sophomore year, I'm a high school American, uh, college all American. Um, my jersey's being sold in the bookshop. I'm getting none of that money, um, and I'm, I'm I'm not exaggerating. I was eating off the Wendy's dollar menu some nights, right? Because I had four dollars left in my pocket, and I'm like, I'll just get four cheeseburgers for a dollar, right? Um, wow. So, and it wouldn't have been. I was. I wouldn't have needed hundreds of thousands of dollars. I was like, if you give a kid in college a couple of grand, maybe five grand a semester, man, I'm, I'm living like a king. I can then right. at least take it. I can take a girl to the movies. I can go to dinner every now and then. Like, couldn't do that, right? Yeah. And that's that was the absurdity of it all. But I walk into the bookshop and $150 jersey, which is doesn't have my name on it, but it's my number. Yeah, it's got to be infuriating, right? I mean, it's yeah, like... It's, it, but the NCAA spun it so well for so long of like they've spun it to regular students of like, look at these, you know, entitled athletes. You have to pay for your books and you have to pay for your your tuition. Like they're spoiled. And then but then people start to finally catch up. Like, but hang on, NCAA, you're, you're getting billions of dollars um, in your account. So I don't think it should be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for athletes. The problem they're going to have is, with Title IX and all that, is it supposed to be equal to every sport? Now, that's a problem because basketball and football bring in all the funds for most schools, most schools. So then that means you got to pay lacrosse and you got to pay volleyball, all the same, right? I don't know how far that goes, but, I mean, the NCAA, you know, they, they, they deserve this to an extent. They, they needed to do this years ago. The beauty of their organization is they don't have a face. Um, when you set up a business the way they have, it's somewhat genius when you look at it because – there's no like Adam Silver or there's no one that you can go to and be like, that guy is the reason why these, you know, it's just this board of cronies sitting in a room that right. they're faceless. Right. And it's, if you set up a business to make money, that would be the way, um, you know, and I think, look, there, there are arguments for, well, the college environment provides you opportunities down the line potentially, but not, not for the 10th guy on a roster. And then on top of that, you do your knee, you hurt yourself. You know, if you're a potential NBA pick and you hurt your knee, like they're not really compensating you post post college life. So there's a bit of a balance there. I think um, for me, it's give the kids um, and the and the students enough where they can actually live a life where they can actually go to dinner once in a while, go to the movies once in a while. They don't need to be buying Louis Vuitton. Uh, bags and, and, and jewelry and, and, and a nice car and all that. I need to be doing all that. I agree with that, but give them enough so they can at least live a decent life in college. And I think that's enough. For sure. And and what was it like getting drafted? And, and now all of a sudden, like you're in, you've been in, in Utah, now you're going to Milwaukee. Uh, what was that experience like when you first went there? Was this, I mean, because it's a big sweat, right? You're basically going to be living somewhere likely for five to 10 years, let's say, or, or, or many years. You know, how how uh, how important is that to you on the the city and the team you go to? Because it's, it's out of your control. You're the number one pick. It is what it is. Was that? I mean, what what was that like? What was your thoughts? And like, where would you have wanted to go? You know, a dream scenario. And how was Milwaukee? How was that experience for you? I was too young and dumb to 
worry about that. Like at that point, and later on in my career, it was important where I lived um, with right. family, kids, and all that. At that point, it was like I'm playing basketball. I'm not from the US anyway, so I'm not tied to any city. Right. Like, it would have been nice to go somewhere warmer. Milwaukee was um, very, very cold. I'd never dealt with snow at that level. I thought going from Utah, oh, I've dealt with snow. I'm fine. I got to Wisconsin. I'm like, this is a whole other level of snow. <laughs> this yeah. is like way different. So I enjoyed my time in Milwaukee. Um, it gets a lot of people talking, talking smack about it, but I enjoyed, you know, uh, the city. The people there were really nice to me. Um, I, I, it's easy to get around. It's easy to do this, easy to do that. But, yeah, it's just – you know, for me as well, it's always got a special place in my heart because I grew from kind of, I believe, a boy to a man during those formative years of my life, you know, late teens, early 20s. I was there, I was 26, 27. So I enjoyed it. Um, it wouldn't have really mattered where I got drafted, to be honest. I wasn't one of those guys. It's like, I've, I want to go to this city. I want to go to that city. Right. But to me, it was just, they're paying me to play basketball. I'm going to do as best I can to try and go out there and play as hard as I can. And it was, you know, it wasn't the best wins losses rock wise for the most time most of the part I was there um and it's yeah it was really good to see them win a championship a couple of years or, or last season because um once he deserves that i think it was them very very cool and you know that that time though when you are coming into the the nba you know there's no i, I don't know to say like a mentor or someone there's no one in australia that's in the nba so like when you who are you trying to talk to and, and advice wise or an agent? Like, how did you transition into this world? Cause it's a pretty big, pretty big jump. You didn't even, you weren't even, I mean, you left college early. You you're the player of the year in college. You're going to the NBA. You know, who was your team or guidance? Like, how did you kind of segue in there? Were you just kind of on your own going to Milwaukee and figuring it out? Uh, there was phases. So there was people along the way that had trickles of, of help, uh, family at times, and then not. I mean, your family can only help you so much with that because they don't know right. you're going through um, the perils, the ups and the downs, the money and all that kind of stuff. Probably my you know, uh, agent, David Bauman, um, he really – he's still a great friend of mine to this day. I think he – you know, he was really, really good for me and kept me kind of level-headed. Uh, the times when I was flying off the radar, like, I hate this, I hate that, get me out of here. He, he talked me off the ledge. Um, and he was he was real worldly. He was He's a lawyer lawyer background, so he knew his stuff. So he was probably the, the, the biggest one I'd go to for advice and things. I still do to this day when I need things. Um, but along the lines, there was numerous different people that, that came in and out of my life for good, good and bad. Um, you know, I get into that on, the, on, on my podcast a bit more in the next couple of months. But there were some people that were, you know, bedside close to me type people that that ended up being fraudulent and did some some some, some dodgy things to me. So, um, you know, I think I've experienced both sides of that, and I, I ended up figuring out that my circle has to be even tighter than it once was because in our industry, there's just—I mean, you probably see it a little bit in yours as well especially around poker and gambling but there's there's so many people you just got to kind of constantly keep an eye on and it's not a great way to live but you have to otherwise you'll be left with no shoes you know that's just the reality of the way the world is and human beings are and it's a shitty way to live because I'm, I'm obviously more cynical than most um but i have reason once people hear my story down the line about why i am they'll definitely understand and i've seen just just some really really bad parts of human beings um, that no one should. And it was a phase in my career where I probably was immature to, to how that all worked. And that's what shocks you most. Um, it's just a kid that had a dream to play basketball. And then you get to that point and you're like, whoa, this is not, this is not what I thought it was, right? Yeah. Well, listen, I, I lived with Michael Phelps for seven years. So trust me, I, I can, I understand because I've seen stuff, heard stuff, stuff that I would never even imagine or thinkable, like, you know, whatever i'm sure it's similar in line right you've seen it all like stuff that you would be like wow that's just like you can't even put that in a movie like how nasty people are and well, people how people believe it that's what's yeah, crazy you you would. Stories, like no way that's bullshit like no, no, no it's, it's, it's shocking legit. stuff so I, I i would you know i'm sure you guys could go pound for pound i know just bits and pieces i hear and see a little but uh I, i'm sure that's part of um part of the life that is again you got to kind of roll with it just part of the, the territory uh what was I, I guess you know moving then when what's the difference between playing on a team when you kind of go in and you realize your ceiling is 500 or, you know, maybe you get an eight seed or make the playoffs versus when you're on the golden state warriors playing with some of the best players in the world, you're having a great, you know, you're a big contributor, you're a part of the team, but like, how is that like 
day to day or walking into the season, what's the energy and atmosphere like? Give me between, let's say, a 500 team and someone that you, you know, you're going to contend for the for the world title. What, what was that like? Well, it depends. I mean, that's the biggest thing for most NBA athletes. When you're on that 500 team, like when I was with the Bucks, I was number one, number two option for most of my career there, like offensively. So I'm getting bulk of the touches, a lot of stuff running through me. Right. My individual numbers are, are pretty good. So when you're on that five, 600 team, your numbers are going to be better, right? Because you're on a team that's not winning as much. When you go to a team like Golden State, where I'm like, okay, now I'm a cog in this big machine of Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, you know, not only do I not eat it, average those kind of points, that'd be crazy to say we're still going to have Bogut as number one option with these two guys, three guys next to him, right? And I'd be an idiot to think that. Right. So the one one mindset is you got to, you got to buy in when you get to those good teams. Not as easy as it's not as easy as people think. Oh, you're on a good team, you're winning, everything's cool. No, there's a lot of teams that can't get to that point. We've seen super teams that can't get to that point because they've got guys that push and pull within the locker room. I'm the man on this team. No, I want the touches. Why is he getting more touches? So I, I, I was fortunate enough to see it on both sides. And the beauty of that Golden State team was we had guys on the team that were just like hey, like I'm happy to buy into my role myself, David Lee, Draymond Green, um, Andre Iguodala, you know, a former all-star comes to Golden State and comes off the bench, you know. So that was the beauty of a good team. But when you're on the bad teams, the struggle is within the locker room generally. It's like, you know, the push and pull, whose team is this? So, um, yeah, going from Milwaukee where, where a goal was just to make the playoffs, that's it. We didn't care if I ate seed, let's just make the playoffs to – right. Golden State and and people forget when when I got to Golden State and when my first couple of years there, Golden State was in a shambles. Like their last twenty years was horrible. They had one or two good seasons in, in in twenty years, and we used to make a joke. They'd celebrate that We Believe year where they they beat the number one seed Dallas Mavericks. They celebrate that every other year. Like every 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 third week, there'd be something about We Believe, and we'd have a joke in our locker room. Like, geez, like it was a great time, but this is all they have. They have nothing else. Like. There's right. nothing else to celebrate unless you go back to like Chris Mullen and Tim Hardaway. Yeah, that was a name coming out of my mouth. I remember number 17 and, yeah. and uh, who else was that? I forget what uh, – no, 20 I'm years. Kind of, yeah, so it's, it's a 20 lot. 20 years, that's all people can remember. So I was like, no, nah, like we need, to, we need to reset this and change this. And we had guys that bought in. We had, you know, people that came into the organization that were really good. You know, Steve Kerr was a godsend at the time. And, yeah, it all just came together for the greater goal of being part of championship. So, I mean – but it's probably harder. It's easier to just be a fringe playoff team. You put up your numbers as an individual. I can then say, hey, I'm putting up my numbers. No pressure on me. I'm doing my job. We didn't make it because I don't have the tools, right? But when you're on that team that should be doing it every year, that's probably even harder because your pressure. I remember going to hotels. Like, we were, we were the Beatles for three, four years. I mean, even after I left and they got KD. Right. We'd go to, we'd go to hotels on the road and, and they'd have hundreds of fans outside our hotel the, the, the lobby entry, we couldn't even get in the, we had to, we had to rope it off and get through and people yelling and screaming. Yeah. We couldn't go to local restaurants because there'd be fans everywhere. Um, it was just a crazy, crazy, crazy time. And we were, we were it basketball wise, not just in the NBA, in the world. We were, we were that team. We were the Barcelona of, of uh, basketball, yeah. you know, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's it's crazy. Crazy. that it's run, yeah. that run too. I mean, so you guys win, you win the championship and then, I mean, they, they one in the I think the last year there is that you guys were it was like you were down three to one to OKC, came back one and seven. I think you had a pretty you know a couple of huge games, uh, and then you got injured. Is that was that around was that the was that that playoffs? Is it like in that finals yeah. right game five or six? I think five. You got injured. I mean, what? Yeah. So that had I didn't to be great finals the season before. Um, we went small ball a lot. I didn't have a great series. I got got benched for the most part late in that series, and. Coming into that next season, we 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 were obviously down three one against OKC. That was the year we won seventy three, went seventy three and nine. By the way, so set a record. Um, and then yeah, got to the finals. And my whole mindset was, I'm not I'm not giving our coaches a chance to take me out of the lineup like a couple of, like last season. Right. And those four games played really well, like mainly defensively. Like I was a, I was a presence in the paint. So when LeBron turned that corner. He knew I was either going to foul foul him hard or block his shot or contest his shot, and I did. I had a couple of games with four or five block shots, and I could see him turning the corner and kind of looking for where I was on the help side, right? Yeah. And then yeah, game five, like game game four, we go to Cleveland, we lose game three, we win game four, up three one. Draymond gets suspended for game five. 
Um, that's at home. So we're like, we should still potentially win it, but Dream One's a huge part of our team. And we were kind of pretty close at that point. We're down by a couple of points in game five. And I think it was start of the third quarter, I believe. I blocked J.R. Smith's shot. And he, for some reason, does a half somersault cannonball right into my leg before I land on the floor. So he's hyperextended my leg before it's touched the floor. And I've just completely, you know, gone bone on bone with my knee. I thought I did my ACL because I, I heard the crack. Um, and then... I was just hoping it wasn't ACL and then got back to the locker room. The whole thing was locked up. Um, and then, you know, I also figured out I tore my fib head um, from the top, you know, top that, that little kind of ball thing that sits in, on the outside of your leg, in the middle near your knee, tore the, the, the fibers off that. And yeah, that was a, that was a really painful kind of rehab, but yeah, it took me out of the lineup and then you give credit to Cleveland. You know, they took momentum back. Those seven game series are a beast for that very reason. You got to win four. Doesn't matter how you do it, you got to win four. And they, they made history by coming back and they did to us what we did to OKC the, the season before. And I guess the most disappointing thing, there are excuses as to why they won. But look, the season before, Kyrie was out for them. So they had an excuse. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just a shame we couldn't capitalize on that. That 73 and nine, it puts a little dampener on that record that no one really talks about as much because, oh, but the 3 1 they lost, you know, so it is what it is. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, still, it's cra- It's hard to make records in this day and age. And, and that is a, that was a long standing one. And to not lose double digits in the NBA season, pretty crazy. And it's nice you got a championship in there. So it's not like you, didn't, you guys didn't get one or, or you didn't get one while you were there. And obviously, Golden State is is a great franchise now everyone respects it loves it knows it modern day it's uh it's one of the the, yeah it's it's one of the great teams what is uh is um is it something like when you so how much say do you actually have like so you have you get an agent you get paired up you find a guy like uh, is it through a referral or you you interview with a few people you get an agent you trust them so after your first contract like how much say do you actually have and do players have and where they go or is it is it like you kind of can hint I want to go this direction or that, but like ultimately, is there a lot? Do you have control at that point? Yeah, you, of course you do. You have a say, um, but you're guided by your agent. Really guides you, um, and they're you know what they say. You're pretty much going to go with. You can have some debate about it, but I was fortunate that during the prime, I was I never went into free agency during my prime. I was always uh, both of my contract, big contracts, after my rookie deal. I signed an extension before expiry, so I didn't even go to free agency. Um, I was happy. Like I was, you know, I did five years, 60 million with Milwaukee after my third year, which was an extension. So I didn't even go to free agency. And then with Golden State, I did the same thing. I think I signed a three year, 30 roughly. Um, didn't even go to free agency. So I was in that unique boat where I was like, you know what, do I, why would I risk going to open market for maybe an extra five to 10 a year uh, over the course. So maybe a three year 40 instead of a three year 30. I'm happy here. I'm risking injury along the way. And so I just, I'd always sign it because I was happy. I'm, I'm like that, that, that extra 10, 15% not important to me. So yeah, you, you definitely have a say, but it's, it's, it's changing now. Like you look at what's going on with James Harden, um, the way, you know, he's, he's structured his contract in a way with Brooklyn. That was genius looking, looking at what he's done now. He's tradable to anywhere, right, right now. But teams know if they trade for him right now, his contract expires at season's end. He can go wherever he wants. Right. Um, so he can basically dictate right now, you need to trade me where I want to go. That team taking me, you know, it needs to be a team that I like, which reportedly is Philly. Anyone else, you've got me for 30 games, I'm out. <laughs> so, you know, it's important these days to structure your stuff the right way and, him and his agent have done it in a perfect way because he technically ha- he's technically like a free agent, really, even though he's under contract. Um, whereas if he would have had a five-year deal remaining or four-year deal, then he's kind of stuck to wherever he gets traded to. If, and then it's a la Ben Simmons. If you don't report, we're finding you, right? So the agent's very important, your family, your friends. But, um, yeah, they can they can also steer you the wrong way as well. So you got to kind of be really balanced about it. For sure. And, and tell me about leaving. the So during the lockout, you went to Australia – to play there. What was that like? And was that a difficult decision to just stand pat or go back home and, and play some games? What well, I didn't play. I tried to. Uh, I had, so I had three years, three or four years left on my deal. That one that I just spoke about, the five years, 60. And yeah, because it was a lockout, it went to November, December. We're like, I better start playing somewhere. So I, I was like, why not just play in Australia? So we started the ball rolling and, and we hit a hurdle with the insurance company. So 
I wasn't going to risk my contract signing the NBL because the NBL deal wasn't going to be for money. It was just more, I'll play. It's a great story for Australian basketball. It's in 2011, I believe, 11, 12. And so all I wanted was like, look, get me an insurance binding cover to cover the three or four years at 40, 50 million that I have left. Get me a binding cover that if something happens, that I'm covered for that, right? And they're like, no worries, we'll chase it up. Essentially what happened was the insurance company said, because you're in a lockout, where what are we insuring? You're not technically under contract. <laughs> so that's where we hit a hurdle. And I was like, I can't risk, you know, losing that contract. But technically the contract wasn't in, in, in force because it was a lockout. You're unemployed right. technically. So they right. played those games. So I couldn't I couldn't end up doing it. So I didn't do it. And um yeah, I ended up just just waiting till the season started. And thankfully the season started no more than two weeks after that. We had to report, I think it was December sixth, if I remember correctly. For sure. And um I, I gotta, I gotta ask about your diet because it looks like at one point you got rid of sugar in your diet and just completely transformed. What was, what prompted you to do that, and and how, when did nutrition become an important part, or you know, when did you get actual like professional help with nutrition? Um, yeah, look, early on in my career, my metabolism was so fast. Like during college and early in my NBA career, I couldn't put on weight. Like and, and I was a big guy, so that was I was drafted to the era of Shaq and Dwight Howard and Yao Ming. So it was all about weight, 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 strength, strength, strength. And um, I couldn't put it on. Like for the life of me, I was in pounds two twenty in college and then two twenty five, two thirty in the NBA. I just couldn't put on weight. And I'd literally whatever I'd eat, I'd be out within twenty minutes. Um, and then slowing up later in my career, it wasn't really that I was struggling. I just saw I watched um I can't remember what sugar is the new fat, I think it's called, or something like that. It was a documentary about sugar and processed yeah. sugar and how much of it is in th- foods that we don't even realize. And um, I didn't get professional advice. I just watched that documentary and then read a lot of stuff online. And I was like, let me just cut sugar out and just see what happens. <laughs> I just wanted to see in the right. off season this, of course. I wouldn't do it in season. So I went like cold turkey. <laughs> like, wow. Um, and I was, you know, it was crazy. I was having headaches and crashing at four o'clock in the afternoon, like it was midnight for three or four days. And then I was good. And then I just felt more balanced. So ever since then, I stay under the day, like the recommended um, grams for sugar, which is 45 grams, equivalent of eight eight to nine teaspoons, which isn't much. So you have a bottle of like Coca-Cola, you're already over for the day. On on top of that, you eat other sugars. Um, so I get most of my sugar from naturals, so from fruit. I'll have some chocolate every now and then, but not like the whole bar. I have a little square or whatever, and right. just feel better for it. Um, and I've tried different things all along the line. I did a fast about two months ago just to try a fast for, uh, I think it's a three-day fast where I only eat dinner, um, a small dinner, and and cut out carbs and sugar. And so I just try, like trying different things and seeing how my body responds. And I think it's all up to the individual. There's so much diets out there these days. It's hard when you Google diet or whatever, like there's – 50,000 things that this one's the best, that one's the best, but it all comes down to what's best for you and, and, and trying different things and see how your body responds. And that's kind of what I did. For sure. And, and tell me about chemistry on a team. Can it, can a team win without chemistry? Like you've been on championship teams, this Australian, you know, U19, you guys win this championship. You, you win a w, uh, an NBA championship. Is it possible? Like you, ha- is there something that you've noticed that's just special on a team? Like, how would you describe that? Is it how important is actual to have great chemistry on the team? Yeah, very important. Um, I, I think there's a there's a line you got to draw. You don't have to like each other off the court, right? You don't have to have the same interests, have the same political views, have the same hobbies, whatever, right? But most good teams can put that aside, separate it, right? Um, now, if you hate each other off the court, that's a different story. I'm just saying you don't have to love each other and hang out with each other three or seven. But generally, the good teams that I've been around. They do hang out off the court um, because we realized on the road, big thing in Golden State that we started doing was we'd get to cities and, and we put in the group chat, hey, dinner, whoever wants to go to dinner, 7 p.m. in the lobby, we're going to go to a local steakhouse, whatever. Um, and it was mainly myself, Harrison Barnes, and maybe a couple other guys that were doing it every other road trip, right? Um, and then look, some cities, you, you might go to a city and you've got family there, so you might not come that trip and that's understandable. But then what started happening was we started having, it went from three to four to five to six players to six to seven to most road trips, we started having the whole squad right. at every dinner. And that was just a small thing and it sounds stupid, but that doesn't happen in the NBA. Like on bad teams, it's literally like 
you've got your locker room teams where these two or three guys go here, they go party. These two or three guys go to dinner. These two or three guys game. They play online gaming. These two or three guys see their family. So you'd never really be together. Where that Golden State scene was like, it became norm where people would be like, hey, where are we going tonight for dinner? And, and you could just see, you know, I start talking to Draymond Green and find out, you know, where he grew up and what he had to deal with as a young fella and his family life and things that I would never would have learned doing layup lines. I can't ask him those questions on the basketball court or in a locker right. room. So those things are, are really, really important. It brings a human element of when right. you want to protect your teammate. So, yeah, really important. But that, those things in the NBA, pro sports, can't be forced. They, they, they have to happen within the group. A coach can't be like, hey, guys, go to dinner and hang out. Right. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like college, right? In college, you do, like, the team dinners and, like, the stuff where they try to, like, keep you in line and whatever. But, yeah, and the pros are not going to have an organization tell you guys got to spend quality time together or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah that's, that's, that is unique. And I, I would imagine that is – one of the formulas of, of a lot of the most successful teams or great teams that they kind of the willingness and like, you know, to want to do that kind of stuff. It has to be within. So um, well, let's take a few questions here before we go. I've got a hundred dollar giveaway. Um, lots to talk about, a lot to cover. Hopefully we can do in the future again, but in the meantime, I do see, uh, make sure everyone does follow the rogue Bogues podcast and you have, I have the link tree up here. Where's the, what's the most easiest way it's on different, um, different podcast uh, podcast outlets is it it's on apple itunes where exactly on everything yeah you're, you're everywhere i mean there's a lot there there's like i said we do a bunch of different series there's a weekly basketball show there's the my journey which is my kind of autobiography podcast we do some political stuff we do in conversation kind of like what you're doing with guests so we do a lot of different stuff it's pretty well outlined um Something there for everyone. You know, some the basketball show is pretty lighthearted. Uh, my co-host swears a lot, the Boston accent, so that makes it fun. But, yeah, I mean, it's something there for everyone. Um, you can also find out what's going on in Australia. I'm, I'm not scared of voice what's going on here with COVID and all that stuff as well. And, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, was going to just ask in general, like, how because i mean it has been a bizarre couple of years i mean it really has like it's just it's it's been strange and at the moment though is it how is the the overall climate there is it like pretty wild like is it is it getting better the situation is there like a, a push for you know more normalcy or is it still kind of wild Cause I, i'm not i'm honestly not up to date on everything but i know australia like for a while i remember there was like celebration parties early on i think it was like i don't know three four five months i remember seeing like the world was kind of locked down, but Australia like had no COVID. That was like what I remember seeing. And then there was some weird story. I saw like they, they said there was an affair or something and it came back in sort of spread. So like, I'm not really up to speed on the current situation. I just know that at one point, I think it was ahead of the curve. Like, is it, is it sort of like, are you going out with them? Is it, is it a mask on right now? I, I'm not up to speed on the situation. Yeah. Look, every state's different. Um, okay. So it's, it's, it's all over the place. For the yeah. most part, like, we, 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 we were locking down, if a state got some states were locked down with like three cases five six months ago, so they'd locked down their borders from other states, so you couldn't even travel freely within your own country. We, we went probably the most gung ho restrictions in the world. Yeah, no, that's I remember hearing stuff like that. It seemed a bit intense from what I remember, but again, I'm not. It's uh, I'm not so up to speed. But COVID's a wild thing, man. It's it's been a, these last two years have just sort of blend together to me honestly it's just been a it's been it, and that for i think more i think you i believe you have two young children i have a two and a yeah. half year old so like you know for them it's it's not like and i live in miami based out of so it's almost like there's been it's almost normal completely like oh, okay. but, well, yeah, florida's it, good yeah florida's been pretty laid back but like you know I look friends that have kids in high school college i have a lot of friends that are you know their kids were fred are literally like going to school senior year and then next thing you know, the next day, they're just like, that's it. There's no prom. There's no like dance. There's no, it's just done. And then they're in college and even the freshman year of college, like that would be very, you know, this is kind of stuff that's like, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit heavy. Like to even think about how you, how that, you know, thinking about your experience, like imagine being the front you're, you're in college and playing basketball, all this stuff, right? There's just a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a heavy subject and topic. And yeah, I don't want to go down. I want to take a few questions. We'll not go down the political. I know you do address some of that on your podcast. People can give it a follow, listen, or we'll just, uh, we'll leave it at that. But um, yeah, we'll take a few of these before. I know you got to get rolling here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. How much, an, how much of an effect did you have on Australian players back home playing as long as you did in the NBA? I mean, do you feel uh, the the effect of Australia has basketball really grown and, and and flourished. It seems very healthy and like there's a lot of strong players right here these days. 
Yeah, I don't think the longevity was a factor. I think the factor was I went number one. I think, um, you know, we, we had Luke Longley, who was on that infamous Bulls team for, for those three championships, and he was kind of the only Australian that had a long-term career in the NBA um, when we were kids. There was no one else that had kind of uh, – we had a few guys that had – a pit stop for a year or two, um, and then they'd be back in Australia. But he he had a you know double digit career, so that was the guy, the only one that did it for twenty years. So for me to come in and, and go number one, it's like who the hell is this kid from Australia? Australian kids are like, hey, I can I can do that now. He grew up near me, or he grew up in in Australia. So then then it was a snowball effect from that. That's what I was proudest about. When I first got drafted, I was a lonely Australian for three, four, five years. Had a few guys come in, and then you know then. Paddy Mills, Joe Ingles, Del Vadova, you know, Ben Simmons, a lot of Australians started. There was a massive influx. At one point, we had 12, 13, 14, 15 Australians um, on rosters, uh, whether they were guaranteed or not. Um, and that's that's huge for a country of 25 million people. So out of nowhere, from like we had zero for a number of years. So I think being drafted and being on the world map with an Australian goal number one was a huge drive and something I'm real proud of to show kids that, you know, you don't have, just have to go to the NBA via Europe and grind your way up. You can actually go and and start from the top, and that's kind of what happened. What, what is the most points you ever scored in a match, in a game, NBA? Uh, I think it's 34, I believe. Um, wow. Yeah, look, I was never a dominant high scorer. My best year was 16 points a night, um, but I was kind of a guy that did a little bit of everything, and towards the end of my career was really important defensively. So, yeah, I think my career I, it might be 34. I could be wrong. It's 34 or 35, somewhere around there. Uh, what Best player in the league right now, who, who do you, who's just the, the, the standout for you or a couple that are just incredible? Uh, this league. season, Jokic, Embiid, um, Giannis is still up there. KD went healthy. Went healthy. Um, Steph's still fun to watch. But I think this MVP season is going to come down to – Yo Kitchen and Embiid, I believe, which is nice to see two big guys wrestling for the uh, for the MVP because big guys aren't getting a lot of love and a whole lot of love anymore in the NBA, especially with the way the All Star voting's going and saying big men, big men are dinosaurs, blah blah blah. It's, it's nice to see two guys that are you know legit seven footers dominating. And and uh, and what about the basketball league in Australia? How is the how is the state of the league and where does that rank? in the world, Australian Basketball League. Uh, and who's the best player right there right now? That's a question from Pablo asking about Australian basketball. Yeah, the Australian League's gotten much better. Um, the NBL, you know, become a, a go-to launching pad to get to the NBA. Like we had LaMelo Ball here a couple of seasons ago. Yep. Um, Josh Giddy, of course, last year, he's playing real well with OKC. I, I did a stopover in the NBL and then got back to the Golden State Warriors for a season. Um, there's a lot of imports, US guys that maybe don't get drafted, they're fringe NBA, and they're like, you know what, I'll go to Australia for a year. Um, we don't pay as much as your top European clubs or even China. But what guys realize is we have a direct connection to a lot of NBA teams now, English-speaking country, great climate, the season's on during summer, Western ideals, food and all that. So the adjustment for guys is really much easier than being, you know, I've had friends that played, you know, deep in China, like Siberia slash borderline of Mongolia, Russia, those kind of places where you're like, whoa, I'm like really isolated here. It's a big adjustment. So a lot of people that appeals to, um, I think the league's top five in the world. Um, I think the NBA is first and foremost number one. I think the top European clubs are still ahead. So your Euro League type clubs. Um, but then I think, you know, it's in the mix there somewhere and it's getting better and better. There's been a lot, a lot of positives, especially over the last five years of, of, the league getting better and better for sure and uh l last one here who do you think is the the nba best of all time the, the i'm sure you get this question a lot it's probably very difficult but do you have give me your top couple like based on your experience that you think are the best or maybe just from your generation i guess since you played against them and you actually you can feel it on the court like during your career who would you say was the best or the top yeah these are, these are tough conversations because you get you get people just losing their shit about it but um <laughs> all right yeah I we think, can skip that one i don't want to put no, you no, that's right. i don't care no no I, I just think it's really era based so like for me yeah growing up in the 90s it's mj right like he was god of basketball so like i i, I think lebron's just as good a player but like jordan the shoes the legacy the icon that was my childhood. So it relates to me better as a child. Like that was the guy, right? But LeBron's up there. 
I think um, I think KD doesn't get as much – he gets love, but because he kind of pushes back to the media and jumps online and talks shit with fans, he doesn't get as much love. But he's he's going to go down as the greatest scorer of all time, in my opinion, um, and I base that on his legit seven foot and the things that he does in the court are unbelievable. Steph Curry's changed the game forever with where he's shooting three balls from and, and what he does. Um, Kobe, obviously, you know, there's a boatload of guys and you probably – there's no wrong answer, but for me, MJ – you know, growing up in the nineties, nineties kid, you know, he, he's he's the GOAT um for me. But I can I can see the argument for LeBron and a few other guys, but it all depends, man, what, what you like and what you don't like, I guess. And and while I'm I'm copying this this link, we'll do this uh this this giveaway quickly. What uh, what is the sports betting like in in um Australia? Because I know they, they took online poker down, uh, uh I believe, or it was brought down what is, what is the stance on like can people bet sports there is that is that a common thing or no or is, is that just poker, yeah, it took poker down because the government couldn't take their hit from it because they're all based overseas so that was the number one reason i believe they, they try to say it was for the safety of our citizens right but you can literally bet on sports gambling is huge here perfectly legal there's numerous different platforms um so yeah i'm involved in one shout out to double they uh i'm involved with a company here speaking of startups that um introduced a unique platform on an app where you can actually chat and converse with people and start groups and talk about your bets and be like, ha ha, Jeff, that was a stupid bet you lost or whatever it is. So shout out to Dabble. But yeah, sports betting is completely legal here. Um, there is a lot of legislation around it now. They have to put on, you know, gambling can do harm, seek right. help if, at the end of all their commercials and stuff because there was, a, there was one point where like if you watch a sporting event, you'd get 100 commercials regarding sports betting. So they were like, yeah. oh, we need yeah. to pump the brakes a little bit. Like it's getting, cause you got kids watching it. Right. So I, I grew up knowing who the favorite was based on odds as a young kid. Right. Like you'd be like, that team's paying $2. They're paying a dollar, you know, a dollar 20. The dollar 20 must be the favorite. I shouldn't know that as a 12 year old. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, that's kind so, of like, how, how is that like playing when you know the lines of games? Cause I always wonder this too. Like I you actually try not to pay attention to it, but look, they're putting on sports center every day and you kind of get a feel, I'm sure midway through the season, if you don't look at it, you kind of know like what's going on. Like, is this? I mean, how is that? How is that to like know the actual if you're favored or not? Does it add motivation? Is it pressure? If you're, how do you deal with being the favorite underdog, or is it just what it is and you're numb to it? You don't even look at it. I did said honestly, didn't look at it. Um, I, I never looked at sports odds. I, I wasn't really a big sports better in my career. Um, right. I do a little bit now, so um, just for fun and because I'm involved with the company. But yeah, during my career. I think there's no point looking at it. Like we knew we were favorites when we were favorites. We knew when we weren't, we weren't. Um, as far as going into a season, you kind of know, oh, we picked the top three. To, we're top three to win a championship this year. That's kind of the basis of what I knew. Right. But I wouldn't look game to game. I know some guys did. Some guys knew about it. Some guys followed it. Oh, they've only, they're, we're underdogs. What the hell? Let's go beat the yeah. shit out of it. Well, I didn't, it I didn't it's crazy it. now because like prize picks, you know, which is an amazing app. I think the best UI UX, like it's fun. I don't, I don't bet sports regularly but it's kind of fun to like look at something or if you can't really you know you you have a couple of favorite players you picked over under but like as a player you know it's interesting right like to see where they value what they think and, and what these sites are, are doing that so i'm sure yeah it's probably a mix some guys don't want to know don't care and some guys like take it as like a they just want to see how they're how they're sized up but i i would imagine it's just, look yeah. man how, it just amazes me how close they get <laughs> that's the, the thing that's like, the I'm great like, thing it's yeah. amazing like literally like the line's nine and you hit eight and you're like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah, the over-unders too, like last second or crazy stuff. Man, sports, sports really are incredible. It's, uh, it's, it's, it is wild. Like how good technology is now. Well, listen, I know you got, man, I know you got a lot on your plate. I know, I don't even know what time it is where you are. I think it might be around 11 a.m. or so, but I, yeah. I do appreciate it. Um, this has been great. I'm going to let you choose the winner for the hundred dollar retweet right here man someone's going 100 for free just just for fun just for engaging asking a question and uh you you tell me when and i'm gonna pick it oh man i remember what the questions were now um we had the mvp question what else do we have uh no no no, no, no you it's a random giveaway this not doesn't oh, have to be random. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry try to tee up what's your favorite question oh what yeah just you just pick so okay. they ask when they're entered okay how many you got total on there I got one right now for a hundred, man. Time, you know, times are we we can't be giving hundred's not bad, man. I'm I'm not breaking it up. This is just a big hundo pack coming, man. How many so, total right. entries is it? Uh, it's one. It's one winner, one one entry. Everyone got gets one shot. 
I'll say, how many everyone's do you have? How many people total have entered? Oh, uh, we've got 82 eligible. I think there was some people didn't follow all the instructions, but there was like a hundred, about a hundred people. So I like one. I'm gonna go with the worst number ever worn by a Laker, number 66. 66. All right. Well, listen, this is what I'm gonna do because I'm not. I was not clear on the instructions. I'm gonna pick the 66 person and. I'm going to do a winner because that this is it's like a retweet random. It could be anyone's going to win it. This okay. is actually like a system, but I'm going to give the 66, 66 and your podcast number 166. So I'm going to give an extra 100 to the 66 question. But right now we're going to pick it. We're going to do it. This is a tool, man. This is the we got to get oh, you this on the on their podcast, the retweet pick tool. And there it is. Killer Rav got 100 right there. So we'll message him. We'll oh, you didn't put a pick on though. You can't have the, you can't have the uh, standard pick. On Twitter, I agree, sure man. He's, it looks like Russian. We got we're international out here. Maybe I'm, like it. I, I'm I'm gonna count it. It's it looks like a real profile. It's not like a bot account. The guys the guys <laughs> active. We're gonna give it to him. That this actually screens like this thing screens out for bots and all this stuff. So it's, it's yeah. uh, I'm gonna say link for it. But listen, man. Hey, I really do appreciate it. This was a absolute pleasure. I learned a lot and uh, very impressed with you. Not only your career, but just how business savvy. You know, you seem very, very sharp, very motivated, and, you know, you're a young guy. And uh, I wish you the best, man. I hope we get to collaborate more on some investments, maybe play a little PLO in the future at some point. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll see each other uh, coming up. That's how we're – it's funny. I've had a couple of podcasts. I've never met someone, and then I randomly ran into them. Like, this happened to me, uh, The Matt Kalish, the co-founder of DraftKings. I had never spoken to him besides the podcast, and then two days later – for New Year's, we were like, I look over and he's like, and I didn't know where he was going to be in the same country. I see him. It happened another time as well. So I'm sure I'll see you very soon. And right. when the World Series, baby. Borders back up. Yeah, World Series of Poker next year. So, man, cheers. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right, guys. That's Andrew Bogut, number 166 in the books. We got Juju Schuster next week. We got a lot of big podcasts coming. We're diving into sports. We're getting out of just poker. But that was Andrew, one of the most uh, very, very decorated NBA 15 year, won a championship, number one overall pick, and was the player of the year at Utah and uh, college. So he's, he's really got a nice resume, and we do appreciate the time. We'll see you guys very soon.